All right, you can be seated. Thank you so much. It's great to see all of you here today, and especially our guests. We want to say again to you, welcome. We, uh, we like to consider ourselves a family expecting guests, and so we're thankful that uh, you're here today. I want to talk to you today about vision. And so uh, vision is kind of an, uh, a big term, but I want to I'll kind of share with you a few things here, and then we'll, we'll kind of interact a little bit. So I'm going to show you a couple of vision statements from some pretty famous companies. And so I'm going to show you the vision statement, and from that vision statement, I want you to try to guess what company it is. So let's see the first one here. People working together as a lean global enterprise to make people's lives better through automotive and mobility leadership. Who do you think that is? All right, Ford. Who else? Any, any other guesses? Tesla? Okay. All right, anyone else? Chrysler? Okay, let's see who it is. It's Ford. Go back to that vision statement again. I know what y'all were thinking when it said people working as a lean, you immediately thought of me, right? Man, look how lean he is. All right, go to, the, go to the next one here. Let's go to the next statement. To provide access to the world's information in one click. It's Google, good, all right? So Google's vision statement, access to information with one click. The next one here. We are a technology company whose mission is to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. Go ahead and show, it who, show who it is. It's Microsoft. That's right. No, a Apple's vision statement is, you know, we want to we wanna create like snobs about our computers who think we're so cool at Starbucks because we got a lit up Apple. Okay, that's their vision statement. All right. So, all right. The next one here. Our vision is to be annoying by claiming we are still America's team, even though we haven't won a championship <laughs> or been... <laughs> Okay, okay, sorry. For Cowboy fans, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm kidding. The Texans, we don't even have one championship, so we can't say anything. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's, um, sorry, that's the Cowboys, you know. We haven't been significant, but we're still America's team, all right? Just kidding. My dad is like a diehard Cowboys fan, and so we have a lot of that going between me and him. But So, vision determines everything, doesn't it? If you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 9. And as you're turning, I want you to think about this for a moment. What is God's vision for the world? You know, Ford's vision determines what they make, right? They want to be an automotive leader, and so they don't, they don't make things that, are not, uh, that, that pertain to things other than that, which would be an automobile or the auto industry. Microsoft deals with tech, you know, IT stuff and computers, and so they don't build cars in Microsoft. Their vision determines everything that they do, and they don't do anything that is outside of that vision. So I want you to think about that for a moment, regardless of whether you are, where you are today, whether you're a Christian or you're a skeptic, or you're somewhere kind of in between, you're not sure about this whole God thing, if you had to try to summarize what God's vision is for the world, and not just for mankind, the world overall, but if you had to summarize what God's vision for your life is, what do you think it would be? So I want to share a couple of verses. They're not going to be in Acts chapter 9. They're going to be on the screen. And then I want to share with you kind of a summary of these. But these are verses that I've selected that are one of many that could have been selected that I believe kind of capture the heart of God's vision for the world. The first one is 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. And that's the Christian's promise that Jesus would return. And Peter's saying, the Lord's not lazy. You might be thinking, well, why hasn't the Lord returned yet? He's like, he's not like men in this way. He said this, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So from that verse, we see that God's vision for the world is that every person in this room today would come to a point of repentance. Now, second verse I'd like to share is John chapter three and verse 17. Regardless of how judgmental Christians may have been in your life, here's God's view for the world. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be what? Saved. So God wants every person to come to repentance. He wants every person to be saved. And Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world. Jesus came to rescue and save the world. In John chapter 10 and verse 10, it's a verse that I often quote. It's a life verse for me. 
The thief comes to kill and steal and destroy, but Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly, or have it to the fullest. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said to his disciples, if any, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and what's the last part? Follow me. So in short, I would summarize God's vision in this way. He wants every person in this room today to find Jesus. He's not willing that any should perish, but that every person would come to repentance, that every person would come to know the salvation that is found in Jesus. He wants everyone in this room to find Jesus. But there at the end of verse 24 in Matthew 16, he doesn't just want you to find Jesus. Jesus is looking for a people who will follow him. In other words, Jesus isn't looking for a bunch of converts. He's not looking for people that have like a religious experience that, yep, I believe Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, and that's all I need. He's looking for people who, who will truly follow him. He wants disciples. And so today I want to study the life of a man and his change. And when he met Jesus Christ, how that experience changed him for the rest of his life. Now our vision at Village Park is based upon these ideas that I've just shared with you. Our vision is to lead people to find and follow Jesus. We're not looking for people to be Robbie followers or followers of this church. We're not looking to, for you to follow us on Twitter. We're looking to find, lead people to find Jesus and follow him with their lives because that's God's vision for the world. And if our church exists for some other purpose, then we cease to be what God has called us to be as a church on the Ford assembly line, if you're a worker on the Ford assembly line there, and your job is to put on bumpers for Ford, I guess that's a part of the assembly line, I would assume. I'm not a car person, but I've seen bumpers. If you're, on, if you're there and you're putting on bumpers, and all of a sudden you show up one morning and you decide, I'm going to go to the Ford factory and I'm going to build Ford trucks and I'm going to put these bumpers on, but you come in that day with a big old truckload of Chevy bumpers, are you going to stay employed there very long? Why not? Because you're not there to build Chevy, you're, bu you're there to build Ford. That's the vision. The vision determines everything that happens in those facilities. It's the same thing with the church. It doesn't matter what my vision is. And it doesn't matter what your opinion is. What matters is, what does God want from us? And what is it that God wants us to do as a church? He wants us to lead people to find Jesus and to follow him. So let's read in, in Acts chapter 9, the story of a skeptic who came to be a believer in Jesus. Verse 1. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that, it, so that if any be found belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The first thing I want you to see today is this. Everyone needs to find Jesus. Everyone needs a personal encounter with Jesus. Jesus. If you look down to verse 20 of Acts chapter 9, you'll find out exactly what it is that when Saul met Jesus on the Damascus road, he became a believer in Jesus. Because later in the story in verse 20, this is what he said. Immediately, he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, He is the Son of God. Saul had a Damascus road experience. There was a place and a time when Saul in his heart met Jesus face to face and he put his faith in what Jesus Christ had done and who Jesus was. In fact, if you look there in verse 5, when Saul asks who this is that's speaking to him, he calls him Lord. And that's a word that would be denoted or used to describe a king or a master, someone who is the highest of all. And so when Jesus appears to Saul, his response to him is, who are you, Lord? And then Jesus said, I'm Jesus, the one that you're persecuting. Now, even if you haven't been around church for any length of time, you've probably heard about Paul. 
Paul was, is the greatest missionary to ever live, lived an amazing life. He wrote two-thirds of the entire New Testament that are found in your Bible. But before this moment, if you look at verse 1, Saul was a persecutor of the church. In fact, he was on the way to Damascus to arrest Christians and bring them back to Jerusalem so that they could stand trial and be killed as Saul had done to a man named Stephen just a chapter before in chapter 7 and chapter 8. Saul was a ruthless guy and he hated anything that had to do with Jesus. So he's on the road to Damascus, he's going there to arrest Christians and all of a sudden Jesus appears to him and Saul has a personal one-on-one -on -one encounter with Jesus. Now at this time, there was something that's called messianic expectation. Throughout the entire Old Testament, the 39 chapters of the Old Testament, that represent roughly about six to 7,000 years of history, there was this Savior that was promised who would come. And the Jews were constantly looking for the one who would come. Now the Christians, when they saw Jesus and the life that he lived, the miracles he performed, and the death that he died, Christians said, Jesus is that Messiah that we've been waiting for. But Saul said, Jesus isn't the Messiah. And in fact, if you preach Jesus, we're going to arrest you and kill you for preaching him. But Jesus appeared to Saul, and Saul met Jesus. And so I want to just ask you a question. What is your Damascus Road experience with Jesus? I want you to think about that for a moment. Where were you when you in your heart put your faith in what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross? I, I was raised and, and taught, I think erroneously in my church, that if you couldn't go back and name the exact hour and date that you put your faith in Jesus, you probably didn't have a relationship with Jesus. And I'm telling you, as a 41, almost 42-year-old man, I cannot tell you exactly how old I was when I put my faith in Jesus. But I can tell you exactly where I was when I found Jesus Christ. I was sitting at a kitchen table at Belmar Baptist Church on Airline Road with my dad sitting across the table with his Bible open, and he shared with me what Jesus Christ had done. That was my Damascus Road. In fact, as Paul later in his life, when he would tell about his conversion experience, when he met Jesus, he didn't really ever mention the time, but he mentioned, I was on the road to Damascus, and there I met the Savior. So let me ask you, sitting here today, what is your Damascus road? Where were you when you in your heart realized that you needed to declare with all of your heart that Jesus Christ is the Lord, that he is the Son of God, that he is the Savior of the world? For some people, their Damascus Road is sitting in their grandma's living room. For some people, their Damascus Road experience is at a church service or at a certain place. For some people, that Damascus Road experience might have been on a mountain I've heard other people, and you're going to hear a testimony later of a young man who said that his Damascus road happened right in his bed, laying in his bed at night. That's where he put his faith in Jesus Christ. So every person's Damascus road is different. But if you can't think of a time in your life, a place, I should say, in your heart where you were when you met Jesus Christ face to face, then what I want to encourage you with is this. Today needs to be the day right here at Creekview Elementary sitting in this location. This can be your Damascus Road experience where you realize that you're a sinner who needs Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ is the Lord and you in your heart place your faith in him. Everyone needs to find Jesus now, after his conversion, Paul, uh, God sent Paul into Damascus, and something else happened. I want you to see it, beginning in verse 10. Now, there was a disciple of Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here am I, Lord. Now, that, I want to stop there for just a moment because I want to speak, especially here for a few moments, to Christians in the room. Those who have a Damascus Road experience that you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ. God appears to a man named Ananias, and Ananias' response is four words. Here am I, Lord. And that phrase or that response is the response of a servant throughout the Scripture. In fact, in Genesis chapter 22, when God called Abraham to take his son Isaac to the mountain, Abraham's response was, here am I, Lord. 
When, when God spoke to Jacob, Jacob's response in Genesis 46 in verse 2 was, Here am I, Lord. When God called Samuel and he called him to be a prophet to the nations and a prophet that would anoint the king, Samuel's response was, Here am I, Lord. And when God spoke to Isaiah and called him to be a missionary to the nations, Isaiah's response was, Here am I, Lord. Here am I, send me. And here in, in Acts chapter 9 and verse 10, there's just what we might call an ordinary Joe, a regular dude named Ananias in the church at Damascus and God appears to him in a vision and he says, Ananias, I have something I want you to do. And Ananias' response is four words, here am I, Lord. Now that response requires humility. It says, Lord, whatever it is that you want, I'm at your disposal. That response requires vulnerability because, I, Lord, I don't know exactly what you're asking me to do yet, but whatever it is that you ask me to do, I'll do it. And that response requires faith. God, no matter what you ask me to do and where you ask me to go, I will do what it is that you say I need to do, no matter how difficult it may be. And for every Christian in this room today, I want you to know this, that God is calling you to something. And if you want to know how to answer God when God calls you to do something, it's four words. Here am I, Lord. Here am I. Whatever it is that you want, I'll do it. When I ask my kids to do something, they don't say, here I am, Father. I'll do it. I say, hey, hey, buddy, I need you to come down and unload the dishwasher. Oh, uh, can, can I finish this level? Any parents feel me on that? Well, I sent uh, our Noah and Ellie, my daughter. Ellie is going to grow up to be a, a hostage negotiator, I'm pretty sure. And I'm not kidding, that girl can negotiate like no other. And so uh, the other day, my, Noah and Ellie wanted to go down to my neighbor's house to play with some of the kids down there. And, and so I texted the mom, I said, hey, Libby, can, can they come down there? And there was no response. Well, Noah and Ellie left. And so then Libby texted back and said, we can't right now, we're about to eat dinner. And I said, well, they're on the way, just send them back. And so the kids came back in and they said, oh, they, they couldn't play. And then Libby texted me. She's like, oh, my goodness, Ellie. And I said, oh, no. And she said, uh, I said, well, what happened? And she said, well, Ellie came up and said, can we play with Jacob and with Ainsley? And I told him, no, maybe about 30 minutes because, uh, you know, we're about to eat dinner. And she's like, how about two minutes? That's Ellie. <laughs> Ellie's response to everything is two. You know, hey, baby, I need you to take five more bites. How about two bites? You know, oh, baby, I need you to wait 10 minutes. How about two minutes? Wait, I got to watch this show over here. How about two shows? Okay, we'll do that. I mean, she, that's the way that she responds. And, and that's the way that many times we respond to God, isn't it? Okay, here's what I want you to do. Okay, well, hey, God, just give me, just give me a couple months. I, I need to get a few things together, and, and then I'll start serving you. Just, just two more months, Right? This, this is what I want you to do with your life. No way, God, you got to give me time. I got to, I got to finish college. I got to do this first. I got to do this. So God, just wait a minute. And so many times we miss out on something great that God has for us because we simply don't respond with God. Here am I, Lord. Whatever it is that you want, I'll do it. So God appears to Ananias and his response is four words. Here am I. But to answer that way is dangerous. Because of what God might ask you to do. Notice verse 11. And, he, and the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight and the, at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Uh, I'm going to share this story on behalf of a friend you know, the, the whole thing online, you know, asking for a friend. So this is sharing a story on behalf of a friend here. Um, there was this, this guy, he's about six foot one, has a goatee, weighs about 250 to 260 to 70 pounds, depending on what scale he's on, uh, w was sitting down one time early on in his marriage, and um, his wife had prepared for him a dish. You might call it that, a dish. And he sat down, and because he was early on in his marriage, he began to eat it. And because he didn't want to create any conflict, he didn't immediately spit the food out. <laughs> he fought that urge to do that. And so he just continued to chew, and the wife was, had, had worked really hard to prepare this salmon casserole or whatever it was that he was eating. And um, she sat down, and 
He just continued to eat thinking, how am I going to finish this? This is what he said. How am I <laughs> going to finish this meal? And he just kept eating. And so she sat down and was fiddling around and she took a bite and she's like, oh, this is terrible. And he said, oh, thank God. I t <laughs> thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. <laughs> I thought my taste buds had gone bad. <laughs> and so I was like, thank you that you said it. I mean, that's what that person said. <laughs> But, you know, it's like one of those moments like, oh, thank, thank the Lord you're thinking the same thing because, you know, in that moment, you don't want to say, oh, this tastes terrible. If they're like, man, this is amazing. Aren't you glad I prepared it? Like, yeah, sure, honey. Yeah, it's, it's great. It's great. But I want you to imagine for a moment, God tells Ananias, okay, listen, Ananias, I want you to go to this street. The street is called Straight, and there's a man there. He's got a house. His name is Judas, and there's a guy in there named Saul, and I've appeared to Saul in a dream. And so he's expecting you to come because I told Saul that when you come, the scales are going to fall off his eyes and he's going to be no longer blind. Because on the Damascus road, Saul was made blind by the light and God told him that he wouldn't be able to see for a few days. And so imagine for a moment what Ananias is thinking. Okay, wait a God. I'm supposed to just go to some stranger's house, knock on the door and say, hey, is, is there a Saul here? Actually, there is. Oh, good. Okay, good, good, good. And then... Imagine what Ananias would be thinking then. To, to go up to someone and say, hey, God sent me here to tell you something, and then you're going to be able to see. Now, there's no indication that this had ever happened to Ananias before. So if it, if it was me, that's what I did. I'd have gone and knocked on his house. Uh, are, are you Judas? Yeah, I am. Oh, thank God. Okay, good. Good. That's good. Um, I'm, I'm looking for a guy named Saul. Yeah, we actually have a Saul. Is he from Tarsus? Yes, he is. Oh, good. Oh, this is uh, unbelievable. But then I would get face to face with Saul and I would immediately begin thinking like, okay, did God really give him a vision? Or was it just my wife's salmon patties from last night? Because those things did mess me up for a couple days. I mean, my friend up for a couple days, I should say. But imagine what it, w what it would feel like to go in. It's like, okay, God, I, I said, here am I, Lord, but are, are you sure this is the plan? Are you sure? Because if I go there, they're going to think I'm really strange to come into someone's house and say, hey, God sent me here because he gave me a vision. He told me he gave you a vision as well. And that vision is for something to happen in your life. And now you're going to be able to see again. That takes faith, doesn't it? But when you read the next verses, you'll see why it takes even more faith. If you notice here in verse 13, but Ananias answered, Lord. So his first answer was, here am I, Lord, a servant. But now he's got some reservations. Lord, I have heard from many about Saul. Saul had a reputation among the Jewish people. How much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to build, to, excuse me, to bind all who call on your name. So he said, okay, Lord, I, I know what you're telling me, but you do realize you're sending me to talk to Saul. This guy is the worst of the worst. He's a killer. You remember a few years ago that there was the, the, uh, the British person that, uh, I think they called him Jihadi John, you remember him? That during the, during the conflict there in the Middle East, that he was beheading journalists and Christians and anyone uh, that he could get his hands on. Remember that? And, and they would show videos of it and, and it was terrible. Now you imagine for a moment that God calls you and says, I want you to go and I want you to reach him. I want you to go to this guy that's been beheading Christians and I want you to go and witness to him because I have a special purpose for his life. Would you answer that call? Because that's Ananias' response to God. God, this guy's a terrorist to churches. I mean, he's here in Damascus. We've heard I'm in hiding from Saul because he wants to bind us and take us to Jerusalem to kill us. And you want me to go to Saul, this guy that's ruthless, and introduce myself to him and then tell him about all the great things that God wants to do with his life. God, you're going to have to send someone else. But notice how God responds to him in the next verse, verse 15. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. 
In Joshua chapter 1, when God called Joshua and the people to go into the Canaan land, the promised land, and, and conquer the land, Joshua had a tremendous amount of fear. And so God told him over and over again, be strong and of good courage. Be strong and of good courage. Have faith. It's going to be okay. I'm going to be with you. And here, Ananias has that same fear. And I want you to know this about your life. When God calls you to do anything, fear is always at the door. It will always be there. And it doesn't matter what it is that God calls you to. If God calls you to commit yourself and your life to the Lord, but your husband or your wife is not there yet, there's fear in that. How am I going to commit myself if my spouse, what are they going to think? And God's response is always the same. I've got a purpose. I've got a plan for your life. Be strong and of good courage. Ananias says, Lord, this is not the right dude. This is not the right, right guy. This is too difficult for me. And God says, I have a special purpose, Ananias, for what I want you to go and do. Years ago, I heard one of my favorite preachers. His name is Raleigh Campbell. He preaches at a church up in Flower Mound, Texas, has a, a, a bilingual church there that is Spanish and, and English speaking. He was a missionary for years in the Canary Islands and then did some mission work down in, in, uh, in Mexico as well and other places. And Raleigh was speaking at our missions conference, and I'll never forget one of the testimonies he shared. They were going up into the mountains of, of one of the, the uh, countries there, and they were just going to some of the poor and most remote villages there. And in those villages, the gospel had never even penetrated those villages. Many of the people had never even heard about who Jesus was and what Jesus came to do. And he shared the story of this one lady that he began to share with her about God and about Jesus, and she was an older lady, a Hispanic lady, and he said as he began to share with her about the truth about who God was and what Jesus Christ came to do, he said the tears just started rolling down her face. And so he shared all the, the gospel that Jesus died, was buried and rose again, and that God came to give her life and to give her life in abundance, to give her joy and happiness. And she said, she said, for all these years, I've known that there's a God. I would stand out in the evenings and I would look at the mountains and look at the sky. And I knew that there was a God that had created all this, but I didn't know who he was. And, and she said, and now you have come and shared with me who Jesus Christ was. And she said, and for all these years, the one thing I've prayed is that, God, I just want to be happy. And what you shared with me tonight has brought me joy and happiness that I've been looking for. God calls us to do things for him that sometimes there are obstacles, but the purpose of everything God calls us to do is the same purpose that God gave Paul in those verses that we just read. God told Ananias, I have anointed him as a prophet to carry my name. And that's what Raleigh Campbell did on the mountainside in that country. He carried the name of Jesus. You see, everyone needs to find Jesus. But everyone needs someone to lead them to follow Jesus. Saul needed an Ananias. Now I'm going to put a statement up here on the board with a blank. And I want you to pray for a moment. I want you to ask God to help you fill in this blank. I am a chosen instrument of God to carry his name before who? Who is God calling you as a Christian to carry his name to? Is it your friends, your classmates, your bandmates, your roommate, your RA at the dorm? Is it your coworker, your neighbor, your spouse, your friend? Who is it that God has chosen you to carry his name to? Because the purpose of every Christian is the same. God is all about reaching those without Jesus Christ. And God needs people who will lead their friends, their family, all the people that you would put in that, that blank. God is looking for people to lead them to find and follow Jesus with their lives. You'll see this in the next verses. Look at verses 17 and 18 and we'll draw this to a close. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, 
and he regained his sight. Then Paul, Saul, arose. And what happened next? He was baptized. He declared his faith publicly. How would you like to be the person that's responsible and got to baptize Saul? Paul, the greatest missionary that's ever lived. The guy that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. One of the greatest Christian minds that has ever lived that God used to write in his word in the annals of history besides Jesus. There is no one who did more for the cause of Christ than the Apostle Paul. He had three missionary journeys, all of his writings, all the people that through the centuries have come to know Christ through what he wrote. And that all started with one man who said, okay, Jesus, I'll go. Even though I'm scared. I'll go and do what you've asked me to do. Billy Graham was one of the greatest, the greatest evangelists of the modern times. And in his testimony, he would talk about his Sunday school teacher who week after week would share with him a lesson in his Sunday school class and led Billy Graham to Christ. And Billy Graham preached to millions of people. And millions of people came to know Christ through the ministry of Billy Graham. But it all started with one sweet lady in a small church in a country town that went to Billy Graham and shared with him what it means to know, to find and follow Jesus. Everyone needs to find Jesus and everyone needs someone to lead them to follow Jesus. So our vision I shared at the beginning is to lead people to find and follow Jesus. So I want to just share with you four steps today. Just four. And I want to encourage every person in this room to take one of these four steps. Everyone here needs to take one of them, including me, okay? The first step is this, find Jesus. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 5, Paul found Jesus on the Damascus road. And if you're sitting in this room today and you have never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, if that's you then today the step you need to take is find Jesus in your heart. Today, sitting right where you're sitting right now, not up here, not talking to me, not anywhere, but your heart sitting in that room, in that place right now where you are, you can find Jesus in your heart. So if you've never done that, today you need to know that you're a sinner, but that God loved you with an everlasting love, and Jesus on the cross paid for all of your sins so that you can have life. And all it takes to have a relationship with God is place your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So if you've never done that today, the step you need to take is to find Jesus. The second step I want to encourage you toward is to be baptized. Immediately after Paul found Jesus and the scales fell from his eyes, what did he do? He was baptized. Baptism is a public declaration of personal faith. It's a public demonstration of what has taken place in your heart. So today we're going to celebrate baptisms here in just a little bit. And baptism is an outward picture of inward faith. When the person is standing in the water and then they go under the water and they come up out of the water, it represents their faith. They believe that Jesus died and then they are buried as Jesus was buried. And as Jesus rose again, they have risen again in their hearts to new life in Christ. And some of you have been believers. You, some of you have been believers a long time. Some of you just a short time, but you've never taken that step to be baptized. I want to encourage you. You need to take that step and be baptized. Make your faith public. It's the first act of obedience that we have as Christians that we're called to do. is to declare our faith publicly through the ordinance called baptism. The third step is to be a part of the church. Join a church. If it's Village Park, great. We want you to be a part of this church. If it's another church, great. We want you to be a part of a church where you can grow in your faith and learn about Jesus and follow him in your life. Listen, life is too hard to live on your own, but the Christian life especially is too hard to live on your own. That's why God gives us the body of Christ. Listen, this church is made up of a bunch of imperfect people who need encouragement to live the life that God's called us to live. 
So if you're not part of a church, I want to encourage you, you need to become a part of the church. You need to join a church and be a part of what God is doing through a local church. When Paul, when, after he was saved here and after he was baptized, notice in verse 19 that for some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. You know what he did? He joined a church. He got around other disciples who could then share with him what it meant to follow after Jesus Christ. And then the last part is in verse 20. I want to encourage you to take the step of lead others to find Jesus immediately. Now, how long has Paul been a Christian at this time? We know at least he's a three-day-old Christian. That's it. For the rest of his life, he had been against Jesus. But now he's a believer in Jesus. And in verse 20, he is preaching in the synagogues and proclaiming that Jesus is the Son of God. You don't have to let, excuse me, you don't have to know everything there is to know about Jesus to tell others about Jesus. You can simply tell them what you know. And what I love about Paul, if you look in verse 21, as Paul was preaching about Jesus Christ, people began to say something. They said, all who heard him were amazed and said, is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon the name of Jesus? And has he not come here for this purpose to bring them bound before the chief priests? Hang on a second, Paul. You're saying Jesus is the son of God? We know all about your past. Aren't you that guy that was wreaking havoc in the church? And aren't you here in Damascus to arrest Christians and take them back to Jerusalem? Paul didn't let his past failures derail him. He let God redeem his past and allowed God to use him for his glory. So four steps today. First, find Jesus. Number two, if you've already found Jesus in your heart, be baptized. The third step If you haven't become a part of the church, I want to encourage you to become a part of the local church. Be a part of Village Park or a church that you would want to join and you feel like you could grow. And number four, take it upon yourself to lead others to find Jesus.